Uh, some thoughts on 1 Samuel uh, chapter 25 and verses 1 through to 22. Samuel dies. We read that in verse 1. And uh, Samuel is uh, God's emer emergency man, as somebody has called him. He carries things forward from the desperate days at the end of the judges to the days of the anointed king, King David. And as David is now in a situation of being the one who is anointed, we can expect with Samuel's passing uh, that he will come forward and the new regime, as it were, will, will go forward with the new king and the new king will be triumphant and the new king will be prosperous. Alas, 1, one Samuel 25 will teach us that this new king He's not the greatest king, ultimately, because he loses his temper and he seeks revenge. He is not the ultimate king. He is the anointed king, 1 Samuel and chapter 16, but he is not the ultimate king. And there is an ultimate king. His name is Jesus. So praise God for that. Uh, but let's look at the passage and we'll see how Samuel dies, people mourning for him. And then we'll see how David moves into the wilderness uh, the wilderness of Paran. And we come across this couple, the couple uh, by the name of Nabal and Abigail. Now, Abigail is a fine, fine woman, and she is called to be discerning and beautiful there in verse 3. And Nabal, yeah, very rich, got lots of property. Uh, we read of that in verse 2. Yet he is a man of bad character, harsh and badly behaved. In terms of character, this couple are a, are a real um, mi uh, mismatch. You know, they're not uh, of the same uh, character at all. So uh, David hears in verse 4 that Nabal's uh, shearing his sheep. And David goes off and sends his young men uh, to go and tells how everything has been going well. And uh, it's all, it all gives a sense of harmony, of peace, of good relationships between David's men and Nabal's men. And everything has been going very sweetly. And David, in a sense, is, is seeking to move that forward. He is, have, he, is, he is, as it were, risking the relationship by asking some, uh, some hospitality, some kindness, some providing, says there, in verse uh, 8, as, as, as David is uh, sending off his young man, he says, Therefore let my young man find fiver in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand as to your servants and to your son David. There's a sense of the humility there, and it's all set up. What's going to happen next? It's a big story, this, you know, it's lots of tension points. What's going to happen next? Uh, well, David's men, uh, they come to Nabal and Nabal. He is a man, well, we've already seen, isn't he? He's, he's harsh and badly behaved. And he, he is not going to accept this. He's, he's just going to uh, turn nasty. So he says, who's David? Is he, who's Jesse's son? Uh, there are many servants. I'm in verse uh, 10 here. Many servants who uh, turn away, break away from their masters. And what's he referring to? Well, he's referring to the fact that David has left Saul. And he's left Saul because Saul was so nasty to him and he was so harsh to him. And so, so this is a complete misrepresentation of David's situation. David didn't just run away from his master. He was forced away from his master. Oh, the misrepresentations of life. Oh, how painful they are, aren't they? You feel yourself completely misrepresented. Ah, ah, but we know one, the ultimate one who was misrepresented, so misrepresented that he went about doing good and they ended up putting him on a cross. His name is Jesus. So there was a total uh, misrepresentation of uh, David by Nabal here. And uh, so he says, verse, he carries on, verse, shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to Give it to men who have come from I do not know where. And he's so dismissive. Of course he knows where they've come from because he knows David and he knows David's background. It's just, ah, it's just manipulation for his own selfish indulgence. So David's men go back and they tell everything to David. And then what's going to happen? Tension again. Verse 13. 
David said to his men, and he's basically said, get ready for war. <laughs> we're not going to put up with this. We're, we're, it's, it's all, it, it's all, he loses his temper and it's revenge. I just want to make a note here. Uh, the, 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 the omission between verses 12 and 13 is key. You can tell when things are going to go well for David. Things are going to go well for David when he takes time to stop and to pray. When he takes time to stop and to pray and seek the Lord's mind and ask the Lord, then you know it's going to go well. But between verses 12 and 13, there's nothing, there's no seeking the Lord. He just goes with his own heart and it is, ah, it's bad news. So we come then with this, with, with, with war in the air, we come to verse 14 and we'll see one of the young men. He's one of Nabal's young men, goes off to... Abigail and basically relates what happened say everything had been going well we'd been treated uh, well they, they the verse uh, 16 they were a wall to us both by night and day all the while we were keep with them keeping the sheep everything had been going well verse 17 now therefore know this and consider what you should do for harm is determined against thy master it's all his house <laughs> and he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him one of his men, one of his servants, knows the character of Nabal. Uh, just, a, just a challenge as regards to ourselves. What do people know about ourselves and about our characters? Those who know us close at hand, those who work for us, those who live with us. What sort of character are we? Yeah. And, and you can see here as well, you can't speak to him. Are we easily approachable? Are we easily approachable? You can often view the character of somebody about whether children will willingly come to them. That's often a test. And, and we're, we're, we're called to be easily entreated. Easily have people come and speak uh, to us. So Abigail then is, is, is faced with a dilemma. What's Abigail going to do here? What's, what's going to happen? And so we said, then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves so abigail's the peacemaker abigail realizes the situation she realizes there's there's conflict uh, at hand between her husband and david and she's going to do something about it she takes action and we should be willing to be getting involved she gets involved gets all her stuff together uh, in verse uh, 18 and uh, verse 19 she gets uh, gets going verse 20 she's on a donkey and she comes to David and his men who came down towards her and she met them. End of verse 20. Attention point again. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's David going to do? What's Abigail going to do? How's there going to be a response? And David, now David had said, verse 21, this gives you something of the flavour of what's in David's mind here. He's up for conflict. He's going for it big time. Let's see how bad it is. Verse 22, God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave uh, so much as one male of all who belong to him. David's set for conflict as a bloodbath at hand. But Abigail, she's willing to get involved. Well, that carries on in the rest of 1 Samuel and chapter 25. But lessons for us to learn. And ultimately we learn. That there is a great ultimate king. David is not the ultimate. Great David's greatest son is the ultimate. His name is Jesus and we worship him. That's some thoughts. Thanks for listening everybody. That's some thoughts on 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verses 1 to 22.